I've always been super impressed by the creativity that comes out of the retro hardware scene. I mean, who would have thought that brand new ISA sound cards with original designs would be available for purchase in 2023? And not only these, but also faithful reproductions or clones of classic cards too. Now there's a lot of people out there who prefer the original hardware from back in the day, whether it's for nostalgia, compatibility, or perhaps they're a collector. For me personally, I really enjoy exploring all the differences and quirks that various sound cards have, and that's probably why I've got dozens of them sitting in a box. But if there's one thing that I've learned over the years, there's really no such thing as the perfect ISA sound card. Some of them have great sound quality but lack important features. Some of them have amazing MIDI capabilities but lack that familiar FM synthesis we remember. Others have great compatibility with older games but sound just plain awful. And some are definitely better and more desirable than others, but they're also getting harder to find and they can be quite expensive these days. Not to mention the fact that 30 years of aging probably hasn't been kind to the capacitors and other components, meaning that they don't really sound exactly the same way they did back in the day. And after having a tantalum capacitor on a PASS-16 explode in a spectacular display of sparks and flames recently, not to mention the horrid lingering smell, I can probably add reliability to that list too. Now, not everyone out there is looking to collect cards or explore the nuances between various sound blaster models. Some people want to build a retro gaming system to actually enjoy games on. What a novel idea, <laughs> something I really need to start doing one of these days. Some people just really don't want to worry about availability, reliability, or features. They just want a card that ticks a lot of the right boxes. They want good Sound Blaster compatibility, Yamaha OPL3 synthesis. They want a bug-free MIDI interface. And most importantly, they want crisp, clean sound, which is something I think we really take for granted in modern times. So today I'm gonna to be taking a look at a card that hopes to tick a lot of those boxes, the Orpheus 2 LT, designed by Edro Ferreira and Leo Dallas, the creators of the famous PC MIDI card. So this is basically the next generation update of the original Orpheus card released a couple of years ago, not to be confused with the Orpheus 2, which is basically this card with a Gravis ultrasound component added to it. So a very impressive three in one card, but with a pretty hefty price tag to match. So for those not really looking for the Gus functionality, the LT retains all of the other great features and updates at a lower price point, and I'll get a lot more into that shortly. So here it is, the Orpheus 2 LT, a pretty reasonably length ISA sound card made in 2023. And although it looks pretty simple, it's a very special card for numerous reasons. Let's start with the primary audio controller chip here, the Crystal CS4237B. So being released around 1997 or so, it's a very integrated chip uh, compared to what was around in the years prior. And uh, not having all kinds of separate ICs all over the board um, definitely helps with audio quality, that's for sure. Now, crystal-based chips may not be the first that spring to mind when you think about premium quality sound cards. And I was pretty curious as to what the main reasons were for choosing this chip. So I asked Leo this question. He told me that they actually did testing on several different chips before deciding on the CS4237 for the Orpheus. And some of the deciding factors were the following. Number one was availability. So availability of the part, access to complete documentation and schematics, and the software to be able to manipulate the configuration EE prom. Number two, it's a quality chip that sounds great. So that's pretty self-explanatory. Number three, compatibility. The older CS4232 was known to be a great Sound Blaster Pro compatible chip, and the uh, CS4237 works exactly the same, just with more features. Number four, not riddled with bugs. Didn't have nagging problems like swap channels or MPU 401 bugs. And number five, it has a resampler and analog to digital converters on board, which allows it to output absolutely everything via SPDIF digital audio. And I'll talk more about that a bit later. And last but not least, it has a Windows sound system or WSS mode that offers up to 16-bit 48 kilohertz playback, which can provide some pretty great results. When it comes to FM synthesis, the CS4237 does have its own built-in, which is called Crystal FM. But on the Orpheus cards, there's no settling for anything less than the best. The LT has a discrete YMF289 OPL3 chip for that genuine Yamaha FM sound. So this is a feature a lot of people look for in a retro sound card, so great to see it here. It's also interesting that the YMF-289 is used instead of the more familiar YMF-262, but I believe that was just done due to availability. Functionally, there should really be no difference at all between the two. 
One very unfortunate limitation of the original Orpheus card was that the Yamaha OPL3 chip could not be used in Windows 95 or 98, only in DOS. If you use the card in Windows, you'd be stuck with the Crystal FM implementation only. So this has now been fixed by making some changes to the way the YMF289 interfaces with the Crystal controller. So really happy to see that that limitation has now been addressed. Another improvement over the original Orpheus card is around sound quality. So Edro and Leo gained a lot of experience after developing the original Orpheus and revamped the PCB with particular attention paid to the output section. The card also employs high quality audio grade capacitors from Nichicon. The limited edition black LT card had more of the through hole gold colored capacitors that had a nice look to them. But uh, due to some supply issues, they had to switch back to surface mount models instead. They don't have the same flashy appearance as the gold ones, but rest assured, they are still Nichicon audio grade caps from the UUQ series. It's hard to really do it justice in a video, but the card has a really high quality look and feel to it, and the attention to detail is very evident. The solder work is perfect, the gold logo and accents look really nice, and the color-coded audio jacks at the back appear to be high quality parts with a great feel to them. It also has a really nicely constructed solid metal bracket, something that's actually harder and much more expensive to have made than you might think. Unlike most mass-produced cards from the 90s, you can really tell that a lot of care was put into this and that they didn't cut corners when designing and building it. So having a brand new sound card with good Sound Blaster compatibility and genuine OPL3 is great and all, but that's really only half the story here. What really makes this card shine above and beyond is its MPU-401 MIDI implementation. For those not familiar, MPU-401 was a MIDI interface developed by Roland in the 80s. It allowed computers to interface with external MIDI synthesizers. But as time went on, manufacturers like Creative Labs and others included somewhat limited MPU-401 functionality directly into their sound cards, allowing connection to devices like the famous Roland MT32 and SC55. There was also the familiar 26-pin wavetable header found on many sound cards that allowed a MIDI daughter board to be connected directly to eliminate the need for external devices and a huge mess of cables. But the MPU-401 implementation used by some sound card manufacturers was just plain buggy. Creative Labs was particularly bad for this for a number of years. Many of their popular Sound Blaster 16 and AW32 models suffer from the infamous hanging note bug. But bugs aside, the MPU-401 implementation included on typical sound cards is what's called UART mode, which basically just relays MIDI data to and from the card. But the original Roland MPU-401 could operate in two different modes, UART mode or normal mode, which is usually called intelligent mode. I'm not going to get too much into it, but intelligent mode basically offloads certain functions like timing, for example, to the MPU-401 for better accuracy and so that the CPU in the system has less work to do when it's playing MIDI music. As CPUs got more powerful, this mode wasn't really needed anymore, but there are still some games out there that require intelligent mode to work correctly. This can be achieved today using a software tool called Soft MPU, which emulates uh, intelligent mode in DOS. It does steal some CPU cycles to do this though, so for older, slower systems, it may not be a viable option. So as you probably guessed, the Orpheus 2 and LT both have a full MPU-401 implementation that supports both UART and intelligent modes. The LT is essentially two cards in one, a Sound Blaster compatible card and a PC MIDI card integrated into the same PCB. Edro and Leo's PC MIDI card is a fantastic product that I bought a couple of years back, and I'll include a link in the description to where you can learn more about it. Although the components on the PC MIDI look a little bit different, they all exist in one form or another on the LT and serve the same functions. You've got your Zilog Z8 microcontroller here that runs the MPU interface program. The program itself is stored in the MXEE PROM here, and there's some working RAM as well. You've also got the Atmel CPLD, which is the glue logic that sort of brings everything together. And in a sense, it's a small computer controlling the MPU port, making it intelligent. Having intelligent mode support is a really nice feature for people planning to run an MT32 on older systems. But PC MIDI is also a very solid bug-free implementation, so you don't need to worry about hanging notes or any other weird problems. It also has a dedicated MIDI out port with a 3.5mm to MIDI connection adapter included with the card. This is really nice because you don't need to use the game port and those clunky adapters like you would with typical sound cards. But you could still use a MIDI adapter on the game port if you want for an additional MIDI out and MIDI in. 
The 26-pin wavetable header is also connected to the PC MIDI portion of the card and is very well placed at the top so that you can use large daughter boards. And it has uh, through holes in the perfect locations too so that you can provide some extra support to those cards. Unlike the Crystal CS4237, the PC MIDI portion of the card is not plug and play, so the IRQ resources are set via jumpers. You can also configure the card to select which MPU-401 controller will be used for each interface independently. Not sure why you'd want to use the Crystal UART controller for anything really, but it's still pretty cool that you could configure this if you wanted to. Another great feature of the Orpheus 2LT is one that you won't find on the majority of vintage sound cards, digital audio out. So being able to completely bypass the analog output section of the card and interface with external DACs or capture devices could be a very useful feature for those really serious about audio. The SPDIF output can be configured to include all audio sources too, both internal and externally connected, which is great. Some vintage cards with SPDIF output only output some of the audio sources, so maybe missing things like FM music or CD audio, for example. And last but not least, we have an AC97 audio header. The AC97 connection standard for front panel connections didn't exist during the heydays of ISA sound cards, so this is really something unique. For anyone doing a retro build in a newer style ATX case, this could be really useful if you like to use headphones. Alright, so let's get this card tested out here. So this is my new sound card testing setup. It's an ECS P5VX-A based on the Intel 430VX chipset and it's got a Pentium 133 in it currently, but I may be swapping it out for an MMX processor in the future. I really love that it's an ATX form factor board. It's just so much easier to deal with on the test bench. But yeah, hopefully you'll be seeing this rig more in some future videos. Next to the board, I have my Roland CM32L here in its lovely, uneven, yellowing beige color. This is the computer music version of the MT32, and it sounds almost identical for the most part. And in fact, there are some games with extra sounds that you'll only hear on a CM32, something for a future video perhaps. I've got it connected to the MIDI port using the included adapter cable, and the audio output is being piped back into the Orpheus 2LT via the line in jack. And we'll do some testing with at least one game that requires MPU 401 intelligent mode and see how this thing sounds. Edro and Leo were also kind enough to include a MIDI daughter board with the LT. This is the Dream Blaster X2 GS from Certico or CertiShop. It's a custom designed MIDI daughter board with a databank full of officially licensed Roland GS audio samples, making it sound a lot like the Roland SC55. Like the original Dream Blaster X2, it has a programmable user bank that you can load with a wide range of samples too. Not going to get too much into it for this video, but be sure to check out the description where you can find out more. You can actually purchase the X2GS and Orpheus 2 LT as a combo deal directly from Edro and Leo at a substantially reduced cost. Normally the X2GS sells for 90 euros plus shipping, but if you get it as a combo, it's only 55 euros with no extra shipping cost. Definitely worth considering, and you could not pick a better card to pair it with, that's for sure. I'll be trying it out with a couple of games, so stay tuned for that. But first, let's take a look at the software and drivers. One nice thing about the Orpheus 2LT is that it's got its own freshly updated software for both DOS and Windows. You don't need to go find some old crystal drivers out there somewhere, and you can rest assured that you've got the right ones. So let's start with DOS. The application that works all of the magic is called Orf Init, written by 640K Not Enough. The Crystal CS4237 is plug and play, so all of the configuration is done via software. Along with the executable, you'll find an INI configuration file that allows you to set all of the relevant resource and mixer settings. The formatting of the file will look pretty familiar to those who've used DOSBox for a while, so that was cool to see. Under the config section, you can set the various system resources for both WSS, Sound Blaster, and for OPL. The FM mode option allows you to switch between OPL3 and Crystal FM, which is pretty neat, although I'm sure most people will just leave it at OPL3. There's also MPU Base and MPU IRQ, but this is for the Crystal MPU 401, which is disabled by default. Remember, the PC MIDI section of the card is not plug and play, and the resources it uses are all configured with jumpers. Moving on to the mixer, there are quite a few settings available in here. You can enable or disable SRS and adjust the center and space settings. SRS is one of the old standards for producing 
quote unquote, psychoacoustic 3D audio using only two speakers. So 3D sound technologies like this were really all the rage in the late 90s. So Crystal proudly displays the SRS logo on their controller chip. I'm not really a fan of these types of audio enhancements, at least not for DOS games. Some of the later technologies like EAX are a totally different story, but still neat that you can enable it here and give it a try if you wanted to. There's volume settings for just about everything in the config file, including PCM audio, FM audio, and for all of the various inputs. Most of the volume values are based on gain, so it might feel a little bit backwards to some people. Lower numbers are louder than higher numbers in this case, but the file comments do a good job of explaining the various settings and their volume scales. And last but not least, there are two settings related to SPDIF digital output. You can enable or disable it, and you can set the routing mode. So it's possible to route only the digital PCM and FM audio to the digital output, or you can utilize the onboard analog to digital converters to route absolutely everything, including all of the analog inputs to it. One great thing about the Orfinite utility is that you can point it to a specific configuration file. So if you wanted to have certain resource or mixer settings for a specific game, you can just create another INI file and reinitialize the card on the fly. And I'll show you an example of where that will be useful a bit later on. The utility also has two different verbosity settings, so you can get a lot more detail about the initialization process on the screen if you want. But yeah, I've got to say, this utility is really slick, and it's worked perfectly for me every time. If you're a big fan of the Unisound driver, I'm happy to say that the Orpheus cards are supported there too. You may not be able to set everything like you can with Orfinite, but all of the various settings available should work, and I'll put a link to where you can find out more about Unisound in the description below. Drivers for Windows 95 and 98 are also available for the Orpheus 2 LT. A Crystal driver package appears to have been customized for this purpose. In the typical Windows 95 style, I had to install the drivers for several different detected components, including the Crystal codec, Crystal MPU 401, the joystick interface, and system control registers. But yeah, everything went really smoothly and I didn't run into any problems at all. Once that was done, I had to run the add hardware wizard to detect the non-plug and play PC MIDI portion of the card. And again, it was detected just fine and appears to work great. There is a small application that gets added to Windows for controlling the Crystal SRS 3D audio, and it does appear to be enabled by default, so just make sure you're aware of that. Enough about the drivers and software, let's give this thing a try with some of my favorite classics. Now, before I get started, I did want to mention that it is difficult to get a true sense of audio quality when you're dealing with capture cards and YouTube compression and things like that. Even at the best of times, it can still be quite subjective, not to mention the fact that many of these older games use PCM audio with pretty low sampling rates, so it's really not going to magically make old games sound amazing. But I will do my best to give an honest comparison afterward based on my experiences with a wide range of vintage cards. First up is Commander Keen 5 from a classic series of games that I really enjoyed back in the day. It's got a really catchy ad-lib soundtrack and it's a lot of fun to play. Next up is Wolfenstein 3D released back in 1992, and this is actually the very first game I experienced with a Sound Blaster card back in the day. After first playing it on a very slow system with reduced window size and PC speaker audio, the difference was night and day.
Next is Blackthorn, released in 1994. I never actually played it back in the day, but it's got a great MIDI soundtrack, and after getting a hang of the rather odd-feeling controls, it's actually quite a bit of fun. And it wouldn't be a sound card review without playing some Tyrion. So in my opinion, it has one of the best MIDI soundtracks out there and sounds fantastic on genuine OPL3 hardware. It's actually one of the few games that I prefer to play without external MIDI modules and sticking with OPL3 instead. The MIDI sounds awesome, but unfortunately Tyrion has a pretty flaky audio driver that's really picky with Sound Blaster clones. And as you can tell, there's some crunchy sound distortion with the audio effects going on, and it sounds pretty awful. It's not limited to Orpheus cards though, and I've experienced this with other brands. Thankfully, having Windows Sound System compatibility can really come in handy in situations like this. The game does require that DMA0 be used for WSS playback, but it's really easy to just create another INI file and then reinitialize the card on the fly whenever you want to play some Tyrion. You can just add this to a batch file and then reinitialize the card again afterwards using the defaults when you're done. Piece of cake. Next, we're going to give the X2GS a try in the system. I'm going to use another DOS game with an amazing MIDI soundtrack for comparison, Descent. I'm going to run through the music test with OPL3, then I'm going to test with the X2GS installed, and then finally I'm going to play it again with a Roland SC55ST for comparison. So let's see what this thing sounds like.
There's no question that the X2GS sounds pretty similar to the SC55, but not exactly the same. In some ways, I actually prefer the sound of the X2GS. I'd say it's a bit smoother sounding with more low frequency emphasis. Definitely some more reverb on the SC55 ST at its default settings too. But what an amazing sounding MIDI daughter board, that's for sure. Let's check out some Descent gameplay, and then we'll hear some Heretic afterward with the X2GS. Finally, as promised, let's check out a classic that requires MPU-401 Intelligent Mode to work correctly. This is Sierra's Space Quest 3, released back in 1989. It's got an amazing intro track that makes great use of the MT-32 or CM-32. So there you have it. I know it's really not easy to judge sound quality like this in a YouTube video, but I can confidently say that the Orpheus 2 LT is the cleanest ISA sound card I have ever heard. <laughs> Almost all of my vintage cards have some degree of background noise, either a constant hiss or interference from other components, but I heard none of that at all from the Orpheus 2. Even with headphones on, when there was no output, the card was practically silent, and I'm really not used to that with vintage cards to be honest. All right, so before we conclude, yes, we do have to talk about price. So the Orpheus 2 LT currently sells for 220 euros. Free worldwide shipping is included, so that helps a bit. But yeah, there's no question, it's a lot of money. And because of this, it certainly won't be for everyone. If you're looking for just a basic sound card to use for your retro build, you can visit eBay on any given day and find an ESS audio drive or less popular Sound Blaster model for 40 or $50. But it will not be an Orpheus, that's for sure. You won't get all the same features, really pristine output quality, and you most certainly won't get the excellent PC MIDI implementation, that's for sure. But in the end, whether or not it's worth it really comes down to you. Now, despite what some people think, Edro and Leo do all of this in their spare time, and they are not pumping out thousands of these things and making a huge profit. When you consider the cost to get the required components, especially in this day and age of shortages, all of the time and effort required for assembly, it's not too surprising that the price is what it is. But the bottom line is, this is a fantastic ISA sound card that ticks almost all of the right boxes. It's got top-notch sound quality, 
genuine OPL3, great compatibility, and a fantastic MPU-401 implementation. And when you pair it up with an awesome MIDI daughter board like the X2GS, you've got an amazing sound setup for DOS gaming, that's for sure. So that's it for today. Hope to do some more retro sound card reviews of both new and old products in the coming months. And I've got some more repair videos headed your way too, so stay tuned for that. Thanks very much for watching, and don't forget to like and subscribe if you'd like to see some more content like this. And also, if you enjoy my channel, please consider supporting me on Patreon. Your contributions help me to purchase more interesting retro hardware to share, better tools, and help cover some expenses. You'll also get some perks like early access to my videos, exclusive behind-the-scenes content, and your name listed at the end of all my videos. You can find more information in the description below. Thanks again. Mm -hmm.